Hello, my beautiful computer science students. Welcome to Unit 5, where we are going to be going over how to write classes. Um, it's Goldie here. I'm going to be taking you through Lesson 1 today, Anatomy of a Class. Um, I also have a little new buddy with me who is going to be um, learning all about writing classes as well. <laughs> so let's take a look at today's objectives. Um, we are going to talk about access and vis visibility constraints with how we write a class. I'm basically going to be talking about encapsulation um, and leading into that uh, why we have private visibility for our instance variables. Now what you'll find is a lot of what we go through in today's lesson we have already gone over in Unit 2. So this lesson is going to be a great review of everything we've talked about in Unit 2 where we first introduced objects and then we're going to learn about some more things that we get to put into classes to help us make those objects. Um, so as we know from Unit 2, um, classes in general have those two primary features. They have um, attributes which are represented as instance variables and then they also have behaviors right, or which are represented as methods. So instance variables and methods those are what we've gone over so far um, as well as constructors and those are really the only things we've talked about in terms of objects. Um, so I'm sorry the text is a little small on here but I wanted to try to fit it all on one slide. Um, we're going to be going over everything we know about a class so far and in unit 2 we introduced the idea of a dog object so that's where we're going to continue on in this lesson and in this unit is with our dog object. So we start off with a dog class and we have instance variables. Now remember instance variables are our data, right? Um, and we'll go through and review some points about instance variables again, but those are the three instance variables we created for a dog. Every dog is going to have a name represented as a string. They're going to have an age represented as an integer, and then they're going to have a variable called good dog, which is a boolean, and it's going to be true if they are a good dog or false if they are not a good dog. And all three of those instance variables are going to be private. It. Next we made our default constructor which had the same name as a dog as our class dog and it accepts no parameters so just open close parentheses and all three of those instance variables get a default value um, so they get a default name um, a default age and a default um, good dog and there should be a semicolon after the word true there and then we have parameter constructors um, which are optional, but they are created when you already have data about a dog that you want to give it immediately. So in this parameter constructor, we already know all three things about the dog, their name, age, and if they're a good dog or not. So we pass the data to that parameter constructor and assign it to those instance variables. Um, you can have no parameter constructors or you could have 50. <laughs> you know, it's up to you. Um, here are just two examples. One where the parameter constructor, again, has all three pieces of data. The next parameter constructor there is where they only have two pieces of data. And we don't know if they're a good dog or not yet. Um, and then we've talked about a couple of other methods that you can add, but really our knowledge of um, class objects stops there. Um, but what we're going to be learning about in this unit is things called accessors and mutators. We're going to learn about the two-string method and the equals method, and then just review some of those other methods we can put into our object creating class. So that's kind of it so far. <laughs> um, that's what we know about making a, um, a class and having a class represent an object. Here's a couple of other things to review, and I'm sorry if my camera kind of cuts off some of this, some of this wording here, but remember that classes represent real world concepts. They're use, really useful for representing actual things um, that has data attached to it. Okay? Um, now these things can be actual physical objects or they can be like an idea or a concept of some kind, um, but they represent something in the real world. Um, so our examples have, have been a dog, right? So if we're writing a program that has a lot of dogs, okay, maybe like an animal shelter program or something where you're going to have a lot of dog objects um, and we want to store data for each of those dogs, we're going to make a class that helps us create those dogs and helps us store the individual data for each of those dogs. 
So we make this dog class, the what we just went over, we have that dog class as a template that is going to create these dogs and then each dog is going to get its own relevant information, its own relevant data attached to it for each dog object we create. And when we create a brand new class, here's a few reminders of things you have to remember. Um, class name is always capitalized. It's always public class and then your class name is capitalized there. Um, the class should go in its own file but in the same directory as the rest of our files uh, for a given project. So depending on which IDE you are using, like we use Replit in our, um, um, in our class, the when we create a new file in Replit, we have to have the name of the class dog followed by the .java extension. And this is true for any IDE you're working with. Sometimes they do it automatically behind the scenes for you. Other times you actually have to type it in, again, just kind of depending on what you're using. Um, but whenever you make a new class, it has to have that class name followed by the .java extension. So this is a little screenshot of what it looks like in in um, in Replit. We have our main .java, which has our main method. Um, but then we also have a separate file, okay? And that's dog.java because it's a separate class, okay? So every class you make has to have its own file with that .java extension. Okay, instance variables. Let's go through and remind you of some things with instance variables. So here's our three off to the side just to kind of remind you as we go through these. Um, our instance variables are always declared at the top of our object creating class. Um, and they're all the attributes that the dog objects will have. So every dog that's created is going to have this set of data. It can be 1, 10, 20, however many instance variables you want to have. Instance variables represent a has a relationship. Um, every dog object has a name, age, and good dog quality. Now, a has a relationship is the only relationship we're working with right now. Um, we get into other relationships later on in, in when we talk about inheritance, um, but specifically right now we only have the has a relationship when talking about instance variables. Okay. When we declare these variables, we want to make them private so that code and other classes can't change their values. Um, making data private is very important in object-oriented programming because we don't want other classes to accidentally change data. Okay. The only class that should be able to change the variables is the dog class itself. Okay, so that's kind of it for the reminders of, of instance variables. Now let's remind you of a few things with these constructors. And again, I have the constructors listed off on the side. Those are what we've what we made um, on that first couple slides there, the default constructor followed by those two parameter constructors. So in order to create an object, we need to call on a constructor, okay? Any constructor, we need to call on one though in order to create an object. If we actually don't have any constructors and we try to create an object, Java does add a default one for us. Not physically add it into the code like you won't be able to see it, but it happens behind the scene. Um, now it's good coding practice for us to always define our own default constructor, um, but just know like for instance on the AP exam, a lot of the times when you're writing out code um, by hand on the AP exam free response questions, they actually won't have you make a default constructor just because that's um, extra time that would have to be spent making a default constructor. Um, so a lot of the times they don't have you actually write that out. Um, and that's just because it happens behind the scenes anyway. Um, otherwise, in this class, when you're writing your programs, um, when you're doing a project, when you're typing something, I really want you to always include a default constructor. It's just good coding practice. Um, in addition to the default constructor, uh, you would want a parameter constructor where you have some initial values given to your instance variables. Um, again, parameter constructors are optional. You do not have to have them, um, but it's always good to just maybe at least make one, okay, just in case. Even if you don't see yourself using it right now, you might end up using it in the future. Um, so I always say just put one in there for right now. Um, constructors, you'll notice these are always public and they have no return type, okay? They're not returning anything. They're just creating these objects. Okay, okay. so that's kind of it for constructors. 
And then um, we'll talk about some of those other methods as well as some new things we're going to add to this class in the upcoming lessons. What I want to kind of finish is with a discussion on data encapsulation, okay? a very um, surface level uh, <laughs> conversation about this data encapsulation. Um, it's one of the pillars of OOP. Okay? because it protects data from being changed. Now, I know in the types of programs we're creating right now, it seems a little silly. Like, of course, we're not going to write code that actually changes the variables. Like, that's just, um, why would we write that code? I'll just remember not to write that code. But as your programs get larger and you start adding more to it, um, it can be easy to forget that data protection. Um, so even though the the um, projects we're making right now are small and it's easy enough to remember not to do it, um, it's good practice to always make it private. Okay, When you make it private, only the class that created it can call and modify the variable. Okay, Both call and modify. Only that dog class is able to use those instance variables. Like you'll remember in our constructors, I was able to say name equals none. Right, I was able to call and modify our name instance variable for that dog. And that's because it was the dog class doing it. Okay. Um, only the class it is created in uh, can call on it. Okay. So let's look at some examples. Okay. This following segment of code appears in a class other than dog. And that's very important. Okay. When, especially when the AP exam, that's kind of the phrase they'll use. So that's why I like using it, which appears in a class other than dog. They say that because that's going to tell you whether or not you'll be able to um, access those instance variables directly. Because this is in a class other than dog, we are not able to access those instance variables. So what you'll see, this is how we create an, a new dog object, right? So we learned this in unit two, but here's a little bit of a review. I'm calling on the parameter constructor here. So I say dog, doggy is my reference, equals new dog, and then in parentheses, I have three sets of data I'm going to create this dog with. Scrappy is the name, two is the age, and false, Scrappy is not a good dog, okay? And then let's say I have this line of code, okay? Where I say doggy, which is my reference, dot good dog, which was an instance variable in my dog class, equals true, okay? So I created Scrappy and I said false. Scrappy is not a good dog. That's gonna be false. And then in the next line of code, I'm actually like, eh, I wanna change that to true, okay? This code is correct syntax. Um, you won't get a uh, compiler error. I don't, well, maybe you might get a compiler error. I actually have to remember that if this is a compiler error or not. But um, it does follow proper syntax, okay? It is true. Um, but you're going to get an error of some kind. So if the good dog instance variable is public, this would actually correctly change the instance doggy. So our instance doggy, our object doggy, it would correctly change their instance variable good dog to true. Okay, it would change it to true, um, but it's not public. Okay, good dog is a private instance variable, so we get this error message. Okay, and actually because I, because um, I need to know. Okay, let me remind you if it is going to be a. Um, um, if it's a runtime error or if it's a syntax error. So let me just, um, I don't have it set up to where you can see my screen right now. Um, and I'm sorry about that, but I'm just going to run this code real quick. Um, good dog equals true. Um, okay. So if I try to run it, da, da, da. okay, it is a compiler error. There we go. I needed to remember that. It's been a while, I had a baby, you know, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna blame the baby for that one. Um, but yeah, that, um, that error message where it says good dog has private access in dog, that is going to be a, um, a compiler error, okay? So that is good, good to remember. That's a compiler error. It's correct syntax, um, and it is able to be done when the instance variable is public, but because it's private, you'll get that that error. 
Um, so in that situation, we were trying to actually modify good dog. We were actually trying to change it to true. What if instead we created our doggy object and we just wanted to access it? So I created, again, my doggy dog, doggy is my reference, scrappy to false. Um, but now I just want to like print the name. I just want to print what that dog's name is. So doggy.name. Again, this is correct syntax. There's nothing wrong with this. Um, and even though we're not trying to change anything about doggy's instance variable, because it's private, we still cannot access it. Okay. And again, you'll have this same compiler error. Name has private access in dog. Okay. If everything was public, it wouldn't be an issue, but it's not. It's private. Okay. So Java prevents any data stored in those private variables from being modified or accessed okay, by any action that happens in another class. Okay. So it protects it. Public means something can be used outside of this class. That's why with our constructors, we were able to actually create our dog objects is because our constructors are public. So we can call on them from outside the class and have no issue. And it's the same thing when we make methods. When methods are public, that means we can call on them from another class. But private means it can only be used by the class it was created in. Um, so these two words, public and private, are called modifiers. There's also a third one that's not on the AP exam called protected. Um, so we're not going to cover that one. I just want you to focus on public and private. Okay? So if you see the word protected out and about, you don't have to worry about that. It's just public and private are the only two accessors. Um, if you do not want your, if you do not want to see our data or modify it after your object is created you have to make use of one of the two methods we're going to talk about in lesson three called an accessor or a mutator method. An accessor allows us to access the data and a mutator method is going to allow us to modify data after an object's already been created. Um, so again, in general, when writing these classes, you want to make sure that you are following encapsulations and making sure that your instance variables are private and that you're using accessor and mutator methods to get a hold of that data or change that data. Okay, even though it seems like extra work and um, just kind of weird in general when you're first starting off, you want to do it. Okay, it's good coding practice to do that. <laughs> Okay, and that's the end of our first lesson, the anatomy of a class. Again, just kind of reviewing everything from unit two, reminding you of a few things, and then kind of expanding on that encapsulation bit. We'll be covering some more fun, exciting things you can add to a class coming up in the next units, or excuse me, in the next lessons in this unit. Um, but for now, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you next time.